British Columbia is experiencing fires more intense than anything in the province's recorded history. In 2017 and 2018, they saw wildfires burn more area of land than in the last 25 years combined. These fires cause complete devastation for those who experience them. As fires continue to rage closer to our communities, we've seen mass evacuations, homes and businesses destroyed, reduced air quality, injuries, and even human deaths. They've been extreme. In these conditions, escape routes can quickly be compromised or cut off completely. Another fire forced a neighborhood to be evacuated. With these higher intensity fires, the impacts on our natural systems are also evident. Soot from wildfires makes its way into rivers and lakes, increasing water temperatures and adding sediment to glaciers and streams that affects aquatic life and water quality and speeds up glacial melting. However, fire has also been an essential part of the forest's natural defense system and disturbance cycle for millennia. So how do we balance the health and safety of our communities while also respecting the natural cycle of the forest? Is it possible to manage wildfires in a way that's both ecologically and socially responsible? Everyone thinks that these systems always existed in this vacuum where there wasn't disturbance. And we think things like forest fire are, are negative because they have you know, negative effects on community safety. Disturbance is a factor that these systems co-evolved with. It was very rare that you would get just full closed forests all throughout these landscapes. This was tens of thousands of years of First Nations people managing through fire and moving grazing ungulates. So you would have to go very, very far back in our history to find a time when things were left alone. <laughs> Indigenous cultural burning, which is a tradition of doing burning for a whole host of reasons. Uh, one of the obvious ones is to create forage for horses, uh, for elk and deer and so on. Additionally, for Saskatoon, for Speedlum, uh, some of the, the food crops and medicinal crops that uh, First Nations depended on. That's a, a tremendous body of knowledge that was handed down on each by, in each band by a fire keeper. And then that stopped quite dramatically in about the 1860s through the 1880s when uh, Europeans arrived, reserves were created, it was made illegal to, to set fire. There was always sort of this pattern where you'd have, you'd have a fire and then you'd have timber close to it. And then in the area where the fire was, you'd have all this forage come up. Where would your elk and deer and your bears and all of those animals go? They would go to the area where there'd been a burn, where there was forage resources. There were shrubs with berries coming up. So that shifting pattern was always, always on this landscape. And when you remove disturbance from a system, you start to see it degrade. We're looking at a 40-year-old stand of trees and we haven't treated it the way it's supposed to be naturally. We removed the fire from the equation, put in lots of fire suppression, and the, what happens, the trees started growing up. Trees are everybody's friends, and the little boy had a wonderful time whenever he went to the forest. But there were other people in the forest too, and some were not very careful. One left a campfire burning. One failed to crush out a cigarette. A lot of these fires came into the communities at night. We have this effect called the diurnal effect of wind. So wind goes uphill during the day and downhill at night. But at night, guess what? We have no air resources. We have a, a volatile problem and guess what? The closer it got to the communities, the more fire suppression that happened there when really we needed to be actually adding fire back into it. In an untreated area, under the right conditions, you can have a running crown fire that is almost impossible to fight with all the resources we have. It, it's just too aggressive. We want to deal with fires that are lower in intensity so we can actually work it. The fires feel fine. 
So they're looking for the best feel and that's how it, it fingers its way through a stand. So, and that's the turn that we use is fingering. It, it, it would come to a trail here, if there's low feel, it would stop. And then this other place, oh, it's got a bit better feel over there, so it fingers up. And what happens with that, unless you sort of join it back out, it becomes very inefficient firefighting. If you go after that perimeter that is like this, you're wasting a lot of effort to control the same thing. So that's why we do burnout operations. Off a trail, we light fire or fight fire with fire and burn it back. When we remove controlled burns close to our communities, we create the perfect conditions for a fire to thrive, while also making fire suppression more difficult. Once we realize that disturbance is key to keeping this environment healthy and keeping our communities safe, we have to start being more proactive. And it just so happens that nature may have the solution. The fires back in 2017 and 2018, the magnitude of those fires was different from anything we'd seen before. And these fires really affected the ranchers and the ranching communities. We were impacted by fire two years in a row. At four in the morning, my wife looked out the window and saw flames coming over the mountain. You can imagine how we felt. We saw the effectiveness of what cattle do when we graze the pastures. We've talked about it for years, about using cattle to slow fires down. I brought the local fire chief up here for a tour when we first came up with this idea, and he was very excited. He, he immediately saw the difference we could make. If you can take out 50% of the grass, it's very effective to slow the fire down. With the fuel management program that we're, we're seeing in behind us here is we have this nice thinned out stand to what it looks like here. And the fire intensity is less. But you see this grass that's beautiful and green right now. But as summer goes on, this grass actually starts to cure. Dry grass is one of the most volatile field types we have in the province. It's one that actually injures people or kills people is generally grass field types. So you can, you can look at all the big flames coming in off of the conifers. Yes, but this is actually more dangerous. So the cattle, just like a lawnmower would do, is they mow this grass. One thing about grass is that if you use it, if you graze it, it'll stay in a vegetative state longer. A cow chews the top of the, the grass off, it wants to rejuvenate itself so it can get to the end of its life cycle. When it's in that vegetative state, it won't burn as easy. And so that's one of the big benefits to uh, grazing these fire interface areas where the logging was done around the communities. Forests act as a carbon sink, absorbing greenhouse gases. But when they burn, most of that carbon is released back into the atmosphere. It's estimated that more than 160 million tons of carbon was released from the 2017 BC wildfires alone. That's two to three times the emissions produced annually by the burning of fossil fuels from all other sectors in the province combined. All these trees that have stored carbon for 50, 80 years goes up in smoke. And so all that that's been stored is unstored and released. Forage is different. Forage saves most of its carbon in the root system. And we also know, and what we're learning is that when we graze it, we create the growth of those roots more. If you let it grow too much, the roots shrink. If you overgraze it, the roots shrink. If you graze it to the right extent, we got the right basic combination of root to stem to really make a difference on carbon sequestration. Grass burns uh, with very little carbon release. Most of it stays in the ground. Grass forage recovers quickly, the trees don't. So we're not only protecting the infrastructure of the society, we're protecting the infrastructure of the forest. Research projects to examine targeted grazing as a wildfire suppression tool are being carried out in BC. Experts on wildfires and on rangeland management, as well as ranchers, have come together to work toward a common goal. There's a vast scientific backing to rangeland management. We need science as an integral component of this because if you don't know what you have, how can you manage it? We want to make sure that this use by cattle is managed sustainably. 
It's the health of the plant community and what that can sustain in its root systems over time. And it's about the other values that we're managing for on the landscape. So we take what's called a safe use factor and depending on the site, that can range from 30% of the forage production to 50% of the forage production. The cages as well give us an idea of the forage potential of the site. And that allows us to say, ungrazed, you know, prior to anything coming in, this site can produce X amount of kilograms per acre of forage. We're not thinking about this just from the perspective of community safety. We're also thinking about it from the perspective of wildlife habitat. We're thinking about it in terms of retaining the ecological stability of this site. We don't want to graze down so much that we have issues with erosion, that we have issues with soil compaction, reducing the, the value and potential of this, these areas. I look forward and it's beginning to happen in various locations in the Southern Interior where we're taking the Western scientific approach to prescribed burning through the BC Wildlife Wildfire Service and other groups and paralleling it with First Nations groups that we're not necessarily melding the two knowledge systems together, but we're walking down the same path, linking arms, sharing the torch. We're not saying that what we're gonna do is prevent a forest fire. What it's gonna do is it's gonna give us the opportunity to manage a forest fire and to be able to bring it under control. Prevention is a lot cheaper than suppression. We can spend hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars um, in a year fighting fires in British Columbia. Because we can't use prescribed burning in, in some of these interface areas, there's definitely some opposition to smoke that's generated um, from prescribed burning and there's inherent risk from, from burning as well and then the planning is quite difficult. So this is another tool, especially in these, uh, these areas where we're identified that we need a landscape level fuel break. We're going in for you know a week to three weeks in that area, making sure that we've got enough cattle in there to bring that down to an acceptable level. Then we move them out and that land is available for those guys to recreate on, but to do it safely. You know, I had the question raised to me before, it says, well, why are we here with the cattle? Can't we be over there? And I said, well, the problem is the valley is over here. The valley is your house. We need to be here, grazing here, so that your house is protected and it gets the best value to the community by not burning your house down. The most important thing is understanding that what we're doing is what's been done for centuries. It's just we're using a different species to do it. People that understand fire know that we can make a difference. If you come in here with a machine or a human to try and do it, all it would be is a, is a cost output. We have a, a tool that, that can remove this fire danger that is producing food to feed the community and add benefit to society. That, to me, is what the whole thing is about. How do we make the soil, the land, the environment better. And I think that in this case, this is what we're able to do with cattle.